today's case shows just how easy it is to blur the lines between normal and evil. Stephen Supple's terrible decisions created a domino effect that ended in him committing the worst crime you can think of. He annihilated his entire family in a desperate attempt to escape the consequences of his actions. But, as you'll soon see, his crimes caught up with him in the most painful way. Join us as we explore this horrific case and try to understand the motives behind his actions. If you're enjoying my videos, kindly consider hitting that subscribe button. Stephen Supple was born in 1965. He grew up as the sixth of eight siblings in Iowa City, Iowa, and graduated from the University of Northern Iowa in 1983 with a business degree. In his youth, Supple worked various jobs, including bartending and lifeguarding, and he was also known for his love of sports, especially football and golf. He was well-liked by everyone who knew him, and friends described him as the funny guy in their group. By all accounts, he seemed like your average, well-adjusted young man. In 1985, Supple's life changed for the better when he met Cheryl at a bar in Iowa. They danced together for a while, but it was clear that there was something more. This encounter blossomed into a relationship that friends described as inseparable. Cheryl had graduated with an education degree, and she was passionate about teaching and working with children. She started her career as an elementary school teacher and was an active member of her close-knit Iowan community. She participated in various book clubs, study groups, women's groups, and Bible study sessions. The couple's shared faith was strong, and they attended St. Mary's Catholic Church regularly every weekend. Supple and Cheryl married on June 13, 1990. This was a union that will last over 18 years, including their dating period. The couple's friends and family often described them as soulmates, two people destined for each other. As the years went on, Supple advanced in his career and became the vice president and controller at Hills Bank and Trust. Despite their professional success and strong relationship, the couple faced challenges in starting a family. They were unable to have children of their own. So, after they'd established themselves, the couple finally came to a decision. They were going to adopt. They flew all the way to South Korea and welcomed four children to their family one by one. The exact dates of each adoption are unclear, but by 2008, their family had grown to include four children. Friends remember the couple's excitement as they prepared for each adoption, often sharing photos of their soon-to-be children with loved ones. The Supples lived in a neighborhood ideal for raising children, complete with a beautiful house that complemented their growing family. A happy, new life seemed to be right on the horizon. Ethan, the eldest of the Supple children, was born in 1997 and was the first to be adopted into the family. He was 10 years old, and he was loved for his intelligence, social skills, and maturity beyond his years. Ethan's interests were diverse, including playing the cello, fishing with his father, and playing soccer. Seth was born in 1999, the second child adopted by the couple. He was described as an animal lover who was quite shy, yet adventurous. He was known to be a sensitive and sweet child who loved nature, especially gardens and flowers. Mira, born in 2002, was the third child to join the family. She was quite the little entertainer, full of energy and always eager to show her talents. Family friends fondly remembered her enthusiasm for learning magic tricks, which she would proudly show during Christmas gatherings. Eleanor, born in 2004, was the youngest of the supple children. At just three and a half years old, she was notably attached to her adoptive father. Their close bond was obvious to family friends who often saw them together. The Supple family, with all four children, was described by those who knew them as such a good family. The children appeared to be deeply loved and well cared for. Cheryl's dedication to being a good mother was so strong that she made the difficult decision to leave her full-time teaching position after the second adoption but she didn't let go of her passion for educating and nurturing. She remained actively involved in the community, particularly at the Iowa Children's Museum. As a lifelong reader, she decided to organize and participate in a local book club, something that was greatly appreciated by everyone involved. The Supel family welcomed four children adopted from South Korea to this home over the years. One friend says Cheryl Supel gave up a full-time teaching job to stay at home after the second adoption, and it showed in her love of kids. She was, um, she, she was very creative and very thoughtful. She loved to read. Um, we were members of the same book club. In fact, she organized it. And um, 
She was very involved at the Iowa Children's Museum. The children also enjoyed close relationships with their grandparents who lived close to their home. Their family-oriented values, along with their involvement in the church and various hobbies, made the Supples respected in their neighborhood. The reason they adopted the four children from South Korea specifically isn't known, but it's clear that the couple were committed to providing these children with opportunities for a better life. The chance to learn English, live in a comfortable environment, and participate in various activities was a major change for these children who had started their lives without their parents back home. Neighbors constantly praised the Supples for their good routines and stable home life. Cheryl often spoke highly of Supple, describing him as a good man, husband, and father. But unfortunately, good times don't last forever, and things slowly came to a breaking point. October 2007. Supple's perfect life was beginning to crumble. His seven-year career at Hills Bank and Trust suddenly ended when he was fired for embezzlement. The company accused Supple of stealing over half a million dollars during his tenure. Apparently, he was slowly siphoning company funds into his personal accounts. After firing him, the bank pressed charges against Supple. During the investigation, which lasted only a few months, he confessed to the theft. But his explanation for the crime was one that investigators were not buying. He claimed he needed the money to support his drug and gambling addictions, but there was no evidence to show that he had such vices in the first place. This weird discrepancy led many to wonder why he would steal and then explain it away with such an obvious lie. He later recanted that story and told investigators he made it up because he could think of no other way to explain the missing money. Despite this, Supple pleaded not guilty to embezzlement and money laundering. He was released on bond and was awaiting trial scheduled for April 2008. The investigation into his finances and lifestyle showed no signs of extravagant spending or even any luxury purchases. The Supple family's lifestyle was described as comfortable but not luxurious. He had taken out a mortgage of $244,000 on their house and had some debt, but nothing that seemed to explain what he was spending the money on. This gap between the huge sum that was stolen and the family's modest, simple lifestyle led to rumors about where the money had actually gone. Some thought it was simply saved up since the economy was terrible in 2008. Others wondered if the pressure of supporting a large family had led him to make desperate choices like gambling the money away. Or perhaps he had simply lost his mind and taken on more responsibilities than he could handle. Steve Supel has been in the news recently for his alleged involvement in a bank embezzlement case. Prosecutors say that Supel embezzled more than $550,000 during the seven-year period that he worked at Hills Bank and Trust. He pleaded not guilty to embezzlement and money laundering charges just last month and was out on bond awaiting trial in April. Hills Bank and Trust also released a statement today saying, Our hearts and our prayers are with the family as they grieve the loss of their family members. There was a lot of speculation about potential regrets regarding the adoptions or hidden marital problems between Supple and his wife Cheryl. But again, these are all speculations and there's no proof for any of this. Despite the financial and legal difficulties, Cheryl handled the situation head on. Anyone else in her situation would have sank into a deep depression, but not Cheryl. Friends reported that she had adopted a positive attitude, waking up at 5 a.m. to go to the gym, focusing on her mental and physical health, and returning home by 7 a.m. to prepare the children for school. She even took on additional responsibilities and went back to work to support her family. While Cheryl was looking forward to slowly turning things around, her husband had an entirely different plan in mind, one that would lead to the unthinkable. In February 2008, Supple was indicted for his financial crimes. He posted a massive bail of $250,000 with his trial set to begin on April 21st. The consequences he faced were serious, and the gravity of his situation could not have been clearer to him. If found guilty, Supple could have been sentenced to a maximum of 30 years in prison, though some sources suggested a minimum sentence of three to five years was more likely. The financial burden on him was immense. Between the embezzled funds and the bail, he was potentially liable for nearly a million dollars. Supple was on the edge. His reputation was tarnished forever, and he lost the ability to provide a comfortable life for his family. All of this had become overwhelming since he thought he had built the perfect American family. But despite how quickly things were falling apart, Supple was still adamant about maintaining a facade of stability. On the morning of March 23rd, a Sunday, 
the Supples attended Easter Mass at their Catholic church. They met with friends and family, including their parents, and no one reported noticing anything unusual about their behavior or demeanor. Even a family friend who stopped by the Supple house later that day and saw one of the children didn't observe anything out of the ordinary. In a joint statement released later, members of their extended families expressed their shock at what Supple had done. They were with the family on that fateful Easter weekend and saw nothing unusual. Everyone seemed happy and content. They knew all about the insane problems the Supples faced, so they were on the lookout for signs of stress in the family, but the day went by smoothly. It was night when Supples' hidden stress came to the surface, and he did something nobody could imagine he'd ever do. March 23, 2008. At 11.30 p.m., Supple left a disturbing message on the answering machine at his former law firm. In this message, he claimed that his family was in heaven. The tragedy began with the discovery that Cheryl had been murdered by blunt force trauma. She was found in her bed in the master bedroom. It was only 42 years old at the time of her death. Between 11.30 p.m. on Sunday and 3.45 a.m. on Monday, Supple attempted to end his and his children's lives through carbon monoxide poisoning. According to a confession letter later found on the kitchen table, he had gathered the children in the family van parked in their garage for this purpose. However, for reasons unknown, this attempt failed, and he brought the children back into the house. And it was here that he did something utterly savage and heartless. Supple bludgeoned his four adopted children to death, one by one, with a baseball bat. The three older children were found in their bedroom, while the youngest was discovered in the downstairs toy room. Neither the children nor Cheryl was bound, police said, but there was also no sign of an extended struggle. After this horrific crime, Supple left voice messages at various locations. At 3.45 a.m., he left a message at his old office, the content of which remains unknown. At 3.50 a.m., he left a message to his own house expressing regret. At 4.01 a.m., he left another message at his house, describing a failed attempt to drown himself in a river. In his words, he tried to drown, but just kept floating. Even when he was no longer present in the home, he continued to document events by calling back to the home and basically self-reporting. At 6.31 a.m., he finally called 911. It is unclear what Supple did between that time and when he used his cell phone to call the Johnson County Sheriff's Department to ask police to go to his home immediately. The tone of the calls to the answering machines is similar to that of the 911 call, almost devoid of any emotion. Stephen Supple made voice message calls to family members, his former employer, Hill Bank, and the voice message recorder within his own home. A voice comparison of the messages left on the answering machines by Stephen Supel and the original 911 caller indicate that Stephen Supel was the original caller. 911 location of your emergency. Hello? Am I talking to Iowa City? No, this is a... Where, what is the location of your emergency? Iowa City, Iowa. What's the address, ma'am? 629 Barrington Road. Please go there immediately. What's going on there? Shortly after, at 6.36 a.m., he deliberately crashed his family minivan into a concrete pillar on the Interstate 80 at high speed. The vehicle exploded into flames and Supple burnt to death. After received another 911 call regarding a single vehicle crash on Interstate 80 near West Branch. The vehicle was found on fire and police have confirmed the lone occupant died in the wreck and that it was the tan Toyota Sienna police were looking for. Now, authorities cannot confirm that the occupant was Steve Supel uh, due to the extensive fire damage the vehicle received. Throughout the morning and day of the 24th, officers had strong, reasonable suspicion that the crash east of Iowa City was Stephen Supel in the missing Toyota van. The fire hindered investigators' efforts to positively identify the car. At no time during the day did we feel that citizens were in harm's way. However, since we could not confirm the driver's identity, we could not lower the level of alertness in the community. As we speak, autopsy, autopsies are being conducted by the state medical examiner's office. Our investigators are present in Des Moines, and this afternoon we received confirmation 
that the driver involved in the fiery crash has been positively identified through dental records. The deceased individual is Stephen Super. Investigators said there was no outward sign of illegal or prescription drug use. People close to the supples still struggle to explain how he could do such a thing. A nun, who had known the family for years, said the community is struggling to comprehend the deaths. She said, We know that if we didn't believe in eternal life and a merciful, forgiving, unconditional, loving God, we don't know how we'd get through it. The adoption center in South Korea, which had facilitated the adoptions, stated that they had no prior indication of any issues within the Supple family. Before he died in a fiery crash, Supple left a handwritten four-page note in which he detailed how he killed his family and tried to kill himself. The note was left in the kitchen and apparently was written for surviving family members. Those who have read it say that he believed he did the best thing he could for his family. The note includes details that match evidence found at the scene and the medical examiner's findings. Supple discussed his life from the criminal charges, noting that his expected absence from home would leave his wife alone to raise and support four children. It had an apologetic tone. Apparently, Supple saw himself as inseparable from his family and was unable to conceive of a future where they existed without him. A University of Iowa sociologist and police investigator said that Supple may have felt pressure to maintain his family's standard of living after his wife stopped working and the couple adopted four children. The U.S. Attorney's Office requested that the case against Supple be dismissed after receiving a copy of his death certificate. The funeral for the entire family was held shortly after the tragedy. Cheryl's father shared his thoughts for the dozens who came to a makeshift vigil and expressed his love for his son-in-law of nearly 18 years. He was like our own son, he told everyone. We loved him like one of our own. March 24th, the day after, would have been Mira's sixth birthday. In accordance with the extended family's wishes, all six family members, the four children, Cheryl and Supple, were buried next to each other. The decision was explained by relatives as what they would have wanted. The death of an entire family can truly scar a town. When Stephen Supel killed his wife and four children, he left people with extreme emotions and a need for understanding. A forensic psychiatrist coined the term family annihilator in the 1980s, and it's been used to describe murderers like Supple. In 68% of cases, the annihilator committed suicide after the murders, and 15% cases involve a carbon monoxide poisoning from a car exhaust. Although familicide cases are relatively rare, they are the most common form of mass killings. Professor Jack Levin, professor of sociology and criminology, has said that the profile of a man who kills his family is a middle-aged man, a good provider who would appear to neighbors to be a dedicated husband and a devoted father. It cannot be ignored that in an estimated 95% of cases, the perpetrator is male and the head of the household. This traditional idea of the man providing for and looking after his family may be one factor when he no longer feels he is meeting this role adequately, often if finances or employment breaks down. They feel that their own financial failings ruined the point of having a family and because they wish to save their family from a perceived threat. When Cheryl returned to work, it must have felt like adding insult to injury to Supple, who had previously prided himself on his ability to care for his family. Murdering all family members was, therefore, a way of saving himself from the hardship and shame of financial troubles and bankruptcy. Such murderers almost always commit suicide afterward. Professor David Wilson has stated that family annihilators have received little attention as a separate category of killer, and they are often treated like spree or serial murders, a view which presupposes traits such as the idea that the murderer snaps or that after killing their partner or children, the killer may force a standoff with the police, which is not an entirely accurate representation of these killers. As we've seen, by all accounts, Supple was a normal person with a normal upbringing. Until the last minute, there was no indication that he was strained enough to carry out a murder. This lack of any red flags makes the case all the more chilling. Do you think Supple premeditated these horrific murders, or did he act on impulse? Do you have any theories about where he could have been spending the money he stole? It's sad that we won't know what actually happened, but this case still haunts many Iowans to this day. Share your thoughts in the comments below. We're on the trail of the next big mystery. Subscribe now so you don't miss the countdown to our next case. See you in the next one.